I feel in the heavens that, that the Lord is saying, well done, people, you made it. Like, really, you made it. Like, you should be, like, you've, you've come through this year. Come on. Like, you have come through the three weeks to flatten the curve. Well done, right? Because, honestly, it's this, um, like, people that survive prisoners of war can't say that the people that just give up and died were the ones that always believed it would end in a month's time or it would end by Christmas or by Easter or whatever. And it feels unusually cruel to just keep people going and going and going, you know? Hey, maybe next week. No, you guys have done it. You have persevered. You're still standing. You're following the tradition of the Christian church since its inception, which is we will do everything to gather even in secret, you understand that the, the underground churches throughout the world are, are struggling to gather, not to not gather. There's no argument in the underground churches of whether they should gather or not, no matter what the cost. Because what should it profit a man that he remains COVID free but loses his soul? <laughs> That's the Ian Carroll version of that one. Anyway, but you've done it. Like, I, I do sense that there is this great. Um, thing in heaven going on at the minute, like, well done. Like, well done, you've persevered, you haven't lost your minds. Despite everything that the enemy has thrown at you to try to get you to lose your minds and to get you to lose your hope. Because the one with the most hope will always have the most influence no matter where they go, right? So it's stirring up that hope. Anyway, that's not, that is not my preach. My preach is this. I, I want to release, everywhere we go at the minute, I want to release a prophetic word about this shift of season. I believe we're moving into a season of different evangelism, of evangelism done differently. Like up until now, we've tried to convince people of their worminess, but that God will take them anyway, right? We've tried to convince people of, of the fact that they're dust, but the, the Father will accept them anyway because of Jesus, right? That's, that's how I got saved. I don't know if any of you got saved that way, but someone tried to convince me, first of all, that sin was sin, because I didn't really believe that sin was sin. I thought it was just, hey, do whatever you want. And so they convinced me that sin was sin, then they convinced me I was a sinner in need of a Savior. That's kind of how evangelism, is, evangelism has been done for a long time. I believe we're moving into a new season. Let, let, me, let me read a scripture to you. God be gracious, this is Psalms 67. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Right, it's based on the ironic blessing, not the ironic blessing, that's a whole different thing. Um, but it's based on the blessing from Aaron. Um, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with fairness and guide the nations on, on the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us so that all the ends of the earth may revere him. I believe we're coming into a season where the blessings of God will be upon his people, so much so that everyone else will say, how do I get in on that? That's what this is about. Lord, that you would bless us, that the nations would know who you are. This isn't about us driving Bentleys. This is about driving nations to Yahweh. Right, this isn't about, you know, our reputation. This is the reputation of a good father. Yeah. Like, this is how evangelism is going to happen. People are going to look at you and you say, how did you get that? How come you got that blessed? Listen, I know who you are. How come that's all happening to you? Well, it's, it's God. It's Jesus, yeah. right? This is Jesus that's pouring out his blessings on his people that the nations would know who he is. Like you see it again in, in the New Testament when, when he says, hey, I, he didn't say hey. 
I will admit that. Well, not that I know of. Anyway, it says, it says in Scripture that, that you're to let your light shine. Sorry, whose light? Your light. Not my light, your light. Vicki, your light. You let your light. Right? Al, your light. Yes. Right? Let your light shine before man. Why? That they will see your good works and glorify your Father? Yeah. Right? You're, 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 it's okay to shine. Like, it's actually okay to shine because what you do is when you shine, you give glory to your Father. And this notion that we really struggle because we're so, sometimes I think we're baptized in vinegar because it makes us, it gives us that sort of sour face, you know, like we've been baptized in vinegar instead of like this redemption water, this restoration of all things of the kingdom. And here we are, we're, we're like, we're, we don't know if God is going to bless us. Or we don't even know if it's legitimate to ask for his blessing. And all the social media warriors are out there saying, well, you can't ask God to bless you and do this. Well, you actually can because children do that all the time. We've just had a morning of it with one of our kids. Like, hey, I need this. Oh, my goodness. Okay. And then we sit down and say, isn't it great to be able to do that? Isn't it great to just be able to say, yes, let's do that? Yeah. There's a... You, you've got to understand that the Father is not unwilling to bless you. He, he's just not. Like, the, this, this isn't a reluctant blessing. That that we've got, we've got it a little bit upside down. What if, you know, I think it was the last time I told you that, that, that I was here, I, I preached about God answering your prayers in seed form, and that what, you know, you have to steward the seed yeah. to see, you have to steward the, the acorn to see the oak tree. Yeah. Well, what if I told you that, that he has probably, probably answered all your prayers that you've ever asked? It's just we don't know what to do with them. We don't, we don't know what to believe about them because we're believing the wrong things. The thing that hinders us from walking in the fullness is what we believe. Let, let, me, let me read, I think this is down here. No, it's Daniel 6. I won't read all of Daniel 6 out, but um, it's not, it's Daniel 3, forgive me. Nebuchadnezzar in a rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar began speaking and said to them, is it true that you do not serve my gods nor worship the golden statue that I've set up? Now, if you're ready at the moment, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments to fall down and worship the statue that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will Im immediately be thrown in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can rescue you from my hands? And of course they said, ain't gonna happen. Uh, that's, that's just not going to happen. So he actually ordered certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up these three guys and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers and they were thrown into the middle of the blazing of, uh, in the furnace of blazing fire. Um, for this reason, because the king's command was harsh and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the middle of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. So, so the story is that, that they're there, and they're actually obedient to God, and they're still tied up. They're in the middle of the fire, and they're still tied up. This doesn't look like freedom. You know, this looks like something else. We could believe something about this. We could make a whole theology around that. You could make great sermons around this about what it means to be tied up in the middle of the furnace. And yet, here, here's, here's the bit that I love. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men that we threw bound into the middle of the fire? And they replied to the king, absolutely, O king. And he responded, look, I see four men untied and walking about in the middle of the fire. You see, if that's us, we pay attention to the fire, not to the fact that Jesus has unbound us and is walking with us. Like, what we believe about a thing is so important. You can talk about the fire, or you can talk about King Jesus setting you free and walking with you in the middle of the fire. That, that what, what we have done is we have, we have created theology around storms. We have created theology around sickness. We have created theology around poverty. We have created the bad theology, can I just say, around all of those. Instead of saying, you know, that the kingdom is, the kingdom has come and it is coming, that my expectancy is that if I get thrown in a fire, there's a fourth man there. That when I'm in the fire, there is someone standing beside me. I am not alone in the fire. And the enemy who just wants you to believe that you're alone in all this, wasn't that the tactic with Elijah? You know, oh, here I am, depressed and alone. I actually know there are 7,000 others. But the tactic of the enemy is just to make you think you're on your own. Well, it's okay for you because you don't have it as hard as me. Absolute baloney. Change what you believe. Amen. Like, change what we believe about this in that my grace is sufficient for you until the breakthrough comes. Yeah. Until the breakthrough comes. Like, I will endure this with one standing beside me in the fire until the breakthrough comes. Like, this is the blessing. Hey, you know what? I prayed the blessing last night, and it didn't work. I actually bought the book of Jabez 20 years ago, and it never worked. I, like, honestly, I prayed for three weeks. We're, we're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be the people of perseverance. It is by faith and prayer perseverance. It's not by praying it three times and saying this is it. It's not, you know, I prayed it three times, and it's not even believing in the promise. It's not believing in the promise. Yes, I know we've just done a school of the prophets, and we're prophesying, and we're giving promises to people. It's not about the promise. It's about he who promised. Like he who promised, the one that's standing in the middle of the fire with you, the one that actually comes down until, until the furnace doors are open. That's who we're with. King Jesus. King Jesus. Man, here's the thing. He believes more in you than you believe in yourself. What if I told you that what you believe about yourself is most definitely a bunch of lies? Would you believe me? No. Because I'm amazing. What, what, what do we know? Like, do you know Moses? Moses is one of my favorites. Like, theologically, Moses is this uh, type of Christ. You know, we talk about the congregation of Moses, the, the ecclesia of Moses, and we talk about the congregation or ecclesia of Jesus. Moses is this archetype of someone who sets his people free into their destiny, and then there's a little hiccup when the people of God said, ah, no, <laughs> no, we'd rather just have Moses do it for us, so if you could do that, that'd be great. But Moses is this amazing leader. And what, the, what you know, do you know he wrote the, the, like the first five books? And, and we, anyway, I won't go into that. But he wrote the first five books of, uh, of Scripture, the Torah. And do you, know, do you know what it says in the Torah? It says, Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. Who wrote that? <laughs> Moses. <laughs> right? Moses, it's a bit like John the Baptist in his gospel saying the disciple that Jesus loved the best, really, you know. You know, there were the other ones, and then there was the disciple that Jesus loved. And you can kind of pick up a little bit of John's humor within it, you know, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, Moses is writing, you know, Moses, the most humble man that ever lived. 
He gets the humble award for scripture. Moses, well done. And I'm not saying that's not true, because it's scripture, right? So I'm not saying that's actually not true. But, but Moses, what do we know about Moses? What do you know about Moses? You don't have to shout out. Uh, so he was born, and um, there was this kind of like murderous thing happening. So his parents kept him until they could keep him no more. And they put him into the, this little basket, and they sent him down the river. And he was brought out of the river by Pharaoh's daughter. And she was like, I'm going to adopt this child, and I'm looking for someone to look after the child for me. Um, that's a great way to be a parent, right? Hey, I'm a parent here, all yours. And um, it was his mother that got to raise him, and then when he was 40, he, and I believe when he was 40, he started to sense the passion of God for his life, the destiny of God for his life, which was to set his people free, right? He started to feel this. He started to have some sense of this going on, so he went out and tried to adjudicate an argument and ended up killing a man. And as a result of that, he disqualified himself because he made a mistake. He disqualified himself from ministry, from his destiny forever. And then Moses, right? We've all seen the Ten Commandments or the Disney thing, Joseph or whatever. Moses. I used to think it was a little bush, you know, like a little shrub. You know, it was a little shrub uh, on fire. But when you see the terrain, it's actually this massive bush that's flaming, and Moses goes down and has to take off his shoes, which is a whole other thing. And then he has this conversation with Yahweh. And what, what does the conversation look like? Hey, Moses, I want you to go down and do all this, 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 this. And then Moses says, Please, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. That's in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. And I'm reading from the New American. So then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. If you're familiar with the story of Moses, you'll, you're familiar with that piece. Because then God says, I want you to have Aaron, and Aaron will be your spokesperson. So the one thing that we kind of know about Moses is that he wasn't a very good speaker. Right? So this is the guy that wrote, he was the most humble man in all the earth, and he's writing, he's writing this saying, hey, I'm not a good speaker. Now, there's really no indication in this that he was trying to wriggle out of it. I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't reluctant, but he wasn't lying. Like, remember, he's standing in front of Yahweh, and he's not lying to Yahweh at that moment. And Moses is actually an interesting character because, you know, God calls him, and he has added up all the years that his people are going to be in Egypt, including the time in slavery and the time before that. And he's added up all the years, and he goes and calls Moses. And Moses is disobedient, and God comes to Moses to kill him. God is actually prepared to find someone else very quickly, I assume, just because Moses was disobedient. It, it's, it's kind of fascinating that sometimes in, in, in Christendom, God will offer things to people, and they'll say, no, this is too hard. God will offer regions to people, and they'll say yes, and then when the going gets tough, they'll say no, plan B. I don't want to do that anymore. And, you know, Reinhard Bonnke talks about, you know, getting the call from God to go and save Africa, and God says to him, you weren't the first person I asked. I think he was number seven or something like that. I think he was the seventh person God had asked, and he was the only one to say yes, I'll do it. Well, that's for free. That's just a slight aside. This is what we know about Moses. He wasn't, he wasn't lying. Moses, I believe, was 100% convinced that he couldn't speak, that he wasn't eloquent. Acts 7. If you get a chance, read Acts 7. It's Stephen's brief history of time. 
It's his history of, of what happened uh, during the, the, the people of God. And this is what it says in Acts 7, 20. <clears throat> what? Well, good shiny things at times. Um, then Moses came on the scene, a child of divine beauty. You know, there was a tradition at the time that Moses, from a child, actually shone. His face shone, that there was something remarkable about Moses, even from a baby, even, even as a baby. And his parents hid him from Pharaoh as long as they could to spare his life. And after three months, they could conceal him no longer. So they had to abandon him to his fate. But God arranged that Pharaoh's daughter would find him, take him home, and raise him as their own son. So Moses was fully trained in the royal courts and educated in the highest wisdom Egypt had to offer. Just, just to be clear, the highest wisdom Egypt had to offer was the occult. So this is Moses, you know, like he's taught to do all the things that, that the priests were taught to do. The highest wisdom that Egypt so. You know, these are the same priests that throw down a staff and it turns down into a snake. Moses was taught how to do all that, but had rejected it to go after Yahweh. So he was educated in the highest wisdom of Egypt, and I'm not suggesting you go and learn the occult. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we, we can't be afraid of people that are powerful. We can't be free, afraid of people that actually demonstrate from another kingdom because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, right? <laughs> I uh, just want to make sure you know what I'm saying. So, uh, fully trained in the royal courts and educated in the highest wisdom Egypt had to offer until he arose as a powerful prince and an eloquent orator. You get it? What Moses believed about himself was not true. And he believed it about himself. Everybody else knew the truth in that he was in an eloquent orator, but he believed he had no eloquence about him at all. I would argue that what you use to disqualify yourself from walking in the fullness of God is an attempt by the enemy to convince you that you're not enough. It's that simple. It is purely that simple. When you say, I can't, everybody else around you is probably saying, don't be so silly. Yeah. You can't? We believe you can. I know, but I can't. And it's till we, until we change that belief that you are actually able, that God has called you to do something, and that means you're able to do it. Yeah. He hasn't called you to do something that you're not able to do. Now, that doesn't mean we can't grow in something, because hopefully we're growing in something. But it means we have to eradicate that thing, but I'm not this, therefore I can't that. We have, this is the warfare, people. The warfare is in here about what we believe, and it's primarily what you believe about yourself. You probably think the person sitting beside you is amazing wonderful, spectacular, especially if they're your spouse, right? You probably think the person next to you would deserve healing, would deserve prosperity, would deserve breakthrough in every area of their life. You probably think that about the person sitting next to you, but you don't believe it about yourself, that we disqualify ourselves because of the lies of the enemy. Listen, there is a Father in heaven who is besotted by you, absolutely 100% besotted by you. And the minute you say, but I sinned, then you're giving more authority to the kingdom of darkness than you are the kingdom of light. Because Jesus said, I've taken away your sins. Listen, you know God can't do everything. <laughs> do you, you know he can't do everything. There are things that God cannot do. All right, theologians in the house, I need you to support me in this because some people think I've just slipped into heresy. There are things that God cannot do. I will remember your sins. So the only person reminding you of your sins is yourself and your enemy. 
that is the only person, no way God is standing there going, well, you deserve this one. Look at the mess you got into. You're totally deserving this. If that was true, then anybody that has had any sickness that they've caused themselves would never get healed, and that's so not true. Listen, about six weeks ago, I'm in a church service in California where you don't have to wait eight months to actually enjoy the weather. I'm just saying, Jerry. <laughs> you can enjoy it all year. It's, it's anyway. Uh, no, it does get chilly. It gets into the 50s some days. <laughs> I tell people winter was on a Wednesday this day, or this year. <laughs> so. um, now that we've lived in California for nine months, we're like, <laughs> we're like nah, 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 nah. Anyway, I was in a church in California about six weeks ago. During worship, the worship was sublime. It was just like, King Jesus, King Jesus. And I hear this. My ear that has been deaf for 37 years popped open. It is, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And it's really weird. It's really weird. A couple of days later, we're out meeting some friends for breakfast, and I'm like, this place is so noisy. <laughs> I can hear them in the kitchen. What is going on? Do you? I'm like, it's like this all the time. Rachel's like, it's like this all the time. I'm driving in, in Rachel's car, and I'm like, your car's so annoying, because you can hear the wind going past your, your window, and the windows, and it's so annoying. It's been like that forever. This is normal life. You just have to get used to normal life. I'm having to get used to how to sleep. I'm having to get used to how to sleep, because I'm used to, like, maybe, you know, covering, oh, that's totally quiet. No, that's great. Whereas now I'm like, no, I can hear everything. This isn't good. <laughs> Right, amazing, I didn't look at, I wasn't, look, listen, I would have, you know, I would have done the obligatory go for prayer once a year. Oh, I should probably go for prayer, yeah. Anyone, anyone here with a deaf ear? Oh yeah, me, I'll go, okay, put your finger in it. Test it, anything, no, no, okay, thank you. I would have done that, because I'm a good Christian. <laughs> zero faith. I had zero, zero, zero faith. And I'm sitting during worship, and a 37-year-old injury that could be described as something I did on myself, just popped open. He is that good, people. He is that good. Like, we're not standing. I love, like, this shouting and shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Like, this whole notion of I am standing in victory. I'm not contending for victory. I'm not fighting for victory. I'm fighting from victory. I'm fighting from this place that that has Jesus said, when the enemy comes and said, has God said, I said, heaven, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he has said. Not only has he said, but he has demonstrated time and time again that he, if he has done it before, he can do it again, right? Yeah. Like this is, this is a, he hasn't lost the ability to, to win. He hasn't forgotten how to win just because some of us have. He hasn't forgotten how to, how to lead the enemy victoriously behind him. It says in Colossians 2, if you ever read it in the message, it says that he dragged the enemy naked through the streets. He dragged the devil himself naked through the streets to show who was actually the victor. This is the place we're in. This is the place that we're saying, God, bless me that the nations would know exactly who you are. And if I need to get out of, out of the way for you to do that, if some of my beliefs need to be changed for you to do that, then God, change my beliefs. You know that whole scripture, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief? That's what it's about. That's part of what it's about. Lord, I believe, but there's a bit of my beliefs that are just a little bit skewy, and most of those beliefs are about you. Listen, I had an experience, whether in the body or out of the body, I know not. And I'm standing in heaven. I have been introduced to this scene in heaven is the best way to, to, to describe it. I've been introduced to this scene in heaven. And what's happening is God is calling the great cloud of witnesses that includes my mom, and my dad, 
and my grandparents and relatives I don't know, and in this great cloud of witnesses, including my mom, my, this, is, this is what I saw. I saw God himself saying, Susie, which is my mom's name, look at your boy. Look at your boy. And it's this moment when the great cloud of witnesses are like exploding, oh my goodness. This is one of Yahweh's own. Is that your son? Oh my goodness, you should be so proud. And then he started doing it about every single one of you. And you're, you know, we're, you know, I'm sitting there going, but I don't deserve it. That's kind of the point. Like that's kind of the point is that, that, that of course you feel you don't deserve it. And it's not about entitlement. It's about a good father that is bragging on every single one of you to all of, the, all of heaven. Listen, there were people there, there were children there who had either been miscarried or aborted. And they were shown their parents. <laughs> they were shown their parents. And God was saying, this is your mommy. This is your mommy. Isn't she amazing? And these kids were going, oh my goodness, I can't wait to meet her. This is heaven's reality. There is not one ounce of despair. There is not one eye being rolled over you. No one. God has never once said, you know what? I really regret making Randall. I mean, all of you are great, but honestly, because there is that one day. He has never once regretted making any single one of you. Never once. He hasn't thrown his hands up and gone, oh, oy vey. Why did I even think of that? No, he had a dream and he wrapped you around it and he is bragging on you right now to all, all the great cloud of witnesses. You have grandparents, you have children that you've lost that are watching you from the great cloud of witnesses. You understand that they are no longer across a great divide. That was, that was before Jesus. Now they're just part of this great cloud of witnesses. And those great cloud of witnesses, God is bragging about you to them right now. It's like they, t okay, it's bragging time, people. You know, <laughs> spin the wheel, who are we gonna pick today? It's not even like that because time doesn't mean anything. It's like God said, okay, who are we going to pick on? And what, what happens, in whether I, I see this in the body or out of the body, and what happens is that everybody gets so excited about Susie's son. That's how much he thinks of you. Scripture says that no good thing will he withhold. Now, we get all religious about it from those who walk his way. Well, I have to walk his way. Well, Anybody born again, you're walking his way. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you're, if you're born again, you're walking his way. If you're not born again, come up and talk to some of us. We'd love to introduce you to the most magnificent person you will ever meet. The one that I believe in this season is going to bless us that the nations would know.